1998. It was a Sunday afternoon, January 25th. My beloved Denver Broncos found themselves in Super Bowl 32. There was a little over two minutes left in the third quarter. And they found themselves in a third down with six yards to go at the Packers' 12-yard line. Quarterback John Elway hikes the ball, takes a step back, sees an opening to run and decides to tuck it and heads off to try and pick up that first down with his legs. As he's doing so, three Packers defenders decide to try and get him, and it doesn't look like he's going to make it because John Elway is no longer young John Elway. He is 37-year-old John Elway, and uh, it doesn't look very good, but he has grit and determination And he decides to sacrifice that 37-year-old body of his and leap in the air to try and pick up that first down. And he meets meets up there with uh, some of the Packers defenders. And he gets spun around, and this play becomes known as the helicopter. Well, John Howie picks up eight yards. They get the first down. Two plays later, Terrell Davis runs in a one-yard touchdown. They go up 24-17 and eventually go on to win that game 31-24. And so why I bring up this particular Super Bowl and this story and this play is because, well, a few reasons. One is it's a great memory of mine. Uh, Two, uh, we'll be celebrating or partaking in another Super Bowl here in in a few weeks. And then thirdly is kind of what we're going to focus on this morning, and that is reputation. You see, John Elway, prior to that Super Bowl 32, John Elway had been in three previous Super Bowls, and he had lost all three, some in terrible fashion. And so at the opening kickoff of this game, Green Bay receives it. They march right down, and they score a touchdown, and all of a sudden the rumblings are, oh, here we go again, another blowout for John Elway, and he's never going to get it done. And so he has this reputation developed as a guy, as the one who chokes in the big game. He can't get it done. Well, Lo and behold, he does get it done, and then he goes on to win the next one, and then he rides off into the sunset being a legend. And in sports, it it becomes very obvious, and reputation plays a big role in sports because there are just sometimes some teams, some players that just can't seem to get over that hump. Even though it looks like they have victory in their grasp, somewhere in the back of your mind you go, "Uh, they're going to choke. I just know it. It's coming. And they have that reputation, and it's a negative reputation. And just like there's negative reputation, there's also positive reputation. And that's kind of what we're going to focus on today when it comes to Daniel, is Daniel's reputation. And we're going to go through chapter 6, Daniel chapter 6, and this is the chapter about the lion's den. Daniel and the lion's den, this is the story of that. But I'm not going to focus a whole lot this morning on the actual lion's den event because, uh, you know, For one, I think we're all pretty familiar with it. If you've been in church for any uh, amount of time, you probably have encountered Daniel the Lion's Den story. If you've never been to church, and this maybe is your first time, welcome. Secondly, if you've not been in church, you've probably heard about Daniel and the Lion's Den in some fashion, even though you may not know all the details. You kind of get the gist of what's going on. And another reason, too, is earlier in chapter 3, we looked at what happened between... uh, uh, Daniel's friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, as we know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were thrown into a fiery furnace. And so uh, these stories, the lion's den and the fiery furnace, they parallel each other very well. Um, There was a a certain prescription by the king for worship. Uh, These guys over here decide not to follow. Daniel on this side decides not to follow. And then there was an uh, ultimate judgment that needed to happen and then an eventual supernatural rescue from God. And so these stories are pretty, uh, uh, they they parallel each other. And and so if you read one, you kind of got, you're pretty familiar with the idea of the other one. So I'm not going to dig too much into that. We're going to go over the chapter just briefly and touch on some highlights. Um, But before we get into actually chapter 6, let's look back at chapter 5. See, last week, uh, Keith Williams, uh, he spoke on chapter 4, and it was the, Basically, the, uh, the humbling of King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he talked about how God gets your attention. That was his focus for that message. 
And so as we see the end of chapter 4, beginning at the start of chapter 5, 23 years have elapsed from the end of chapter 4 to the beginning of chapter 5. So it's one of those like 23 years later kind of thing appears. And so we find ourselves introduced with another leader. His name is King Belshazzar. Now, King Belshazzar was likely the grandson of King Nebuchadnezzar by way of marriage. His father, Nebuchadnezzar, was married into the family. And for whatever reason, uh, Babylonian chronicles say that Nebuchadnezzar decided to vacate the throne for uh, a period of time. And so we find his son in, uh, in place of uh, leadership now as we start uh, looking into chapter 5 and just kind of going over it again. But here they are, and he, we find King Belshazzar throwing a feast. And it's odd because this is a terrible time to throw a feast because they are on the brink of destruction. Cyrus the Persian and the army is literally at their doorstep. They're, they got the place surrounded. They conquered a lot of the area, and Babylon, the city, is the last thing standing. And so he throws this big feast. And scholars believe that the reason being is he's trying to appease one of the deities, one of their deities, uh, or multiple of the deities, to hopefully come and bail him out of the situation. That's the purpose for this. But in the revelry that's going on with the party, they decide, hey, why don't we go get some you know, articles that we've taken from the temple in Jerusalem, and we utilize those for our party. So they do. And in judgment of this, then we see or King Belshazzar all of a sudden sees writing. There's a hand that appears and fingers, and they begin to write on the wall. And this freaks him out so much so that the text says that he soils himself. And so he, he, he doesn't understand what's going on. And he calls in all the magicians, um, the, the sorcerers, to try and figure out, hey, tell me what this is about. He can't figure it out. They come, they can't figure it out either. And so there's just all this hoopla going on. And then in comes the queen mother. She wasn't at this party. And it's not his wife, the queen. It's, uh, it's likely uh, his mom. And so she's not there. But by this time, likely she's heard all the commotion going on. And so she comes down and she begins to give him a little bit of advice. And so that's what we're going to pick up. And that's going to be here in verse 11 of chapter 5. And it says, this is the queen mother speaking. She says, there is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the days of your predecessor, he was found to have insight, intelligence, and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods. Your predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians, mediums, Chaldeans, and uh, diviners. And your own predecessor, the king, did this because Daniel, the one the king named Belteshazzar, was found to have an extraordinary spirit. You can underline that, extraordinary spirit, if you're one of those that marks in your Bible. So he had an extraordinary spirit, knowledge, and intelligence, and the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems. Therefore, summon Daniel, and he will give you the interpretation. So, as I said at the beginning of this, uh, start of this chapter, it's 23 years later. Daniel now is no longer a young man when we first get introduced to him in chapter 1. He was likely uh, early teens, and now he is about 82, 84 years old. He's an 80-year-old man. And he wasn't called with the initial wave of people to try and help the King Belshazzar decipher whatever this message was. So the reason is probably he was either in retirement or just forgotten about. You know, that's a lot of time to pass. And there's a change in leadership and likely he was just forgotten about. So there he is likely sitting on his couch wondering what to do. And then here comes a knock and they say, hey, look, the king needs you. So he gets up, he goes, he interprets the writing on the wall and it's not a good thing for King Belshazzar. It's basically a judgment on him. And so we see at the end of chapter 5, uh, verse 30, it says, That very night, Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom at the age of 62. So Babylon is, uh, is taken over, it's sacked, and uh, King uh, Belshazzar is dead. And now here comes this new leader on the scene. His name is Darius the Mede. Now, this Darius the Mede, just a little side note, is he's kind of a controversial uh, figure in biblical studies because there's some that they, they can't find a Darius the Mede. Some argue that because they can't find a leader under that title that 
the whole book should be thrown out because it, it's inaccurate and whatnot, and others argue for other things, but and that's for another time and another place. But ultimately, it's in Scripture, and, uh, and so he obviously was a leader that was at this time. And so getting into chapter 6, <clears throat> Darius, starting in verse 1, Darius decided to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom, stationed throughout the realm, and over them, three administrators, including Daniel. Now, these satraps would uh, be accountable to them so that the king would not be defrauded. And Daniel distinguished himself above the administrators and satraps because, here it is again, he had an extraordinary spirit. You want to underline? So the king planned to set him over the whole realm. So Daniel finds himself in a place of prominence again. And it's kind of a common theme in his life that... You know, the Spirit of God is on him, and he rises to the top. And so he's now this older gentleman, and he's in a, a good place of prominence. And the way things would be, you know, obviously people want to climb the career ladder. And he's working with all these other guys, and I'm sure they're looking at him going, I would like to be in his place because he's got a good place of stature, a good place of leadership. But with Daniel, they can't find anything about this guy in which they could bring accusations to King Belshazzar, they say, you know, he's, he's a good dude. He's not scheming any money off the top. And so we can't find anything wrong with him to get him out. So what can we get him with? Well, the one thing that he is known for is being a man with an extraordinary spirit, and thus his worship to God is consistent. He's a good man. He's faithful in that. So let's devise a plan to, to get him with that. And so they do. So they devise this plan to... Convince the king, playing into his pride, saying, Hey, King Darius, why don't you set up this law or this edict that says nobody can petition you or nobody can petition any other god or any other man for the next 30 days except for you, great king. And uh, anyone who doesn't, well, they get thrown into a lion's den. How, how does that sound? And of course, you know, he's, yeah, that sounds awesome. So he does. And verse 9, it says, So King Darius signed the written edict. So he, he signs this thing. He plays into it. Verse 10. And when Daniel learned that the document had been signed, he went into his house. It's not he went into his house and then opened the windows and began to pray. It's not that he went into his house and then began to uh, uh, openly protest. No, he just went into his house. All right. It is what it is. The windows in its upstairs room opened towards Jerusalem being obedient to King Solomon's decree. If you're not in Jerusalem, worship towards Jerusalem. And so he's doing that. He's worshiping three times a day. He got down on his knees. He prayed and gave thanks to his God, just as he had always done before. If you can underline that. And, or as the uh, New Living Translation, as, just as he had always done. So just as he had done before. So this is not like he heard about this law being passed and then decided to go you know, throw open the windows and begin to loudly proclaim uh, in defiance. No, he just, this is what I do. Nothing's going to change. I'm just going to continue to do what I do, and that's worship God. And so he does. And then in verse 11, it says that these men went up as a group, and they found Daniel petitioning his God. And so they, they knew it. They're like, all right, well, let's go as a group so we have more witnesses, and we see him, that he's not following the edict of the king. And so they go to the king, and they say, hey, king, didn't you sign this law that nobody can do this? And he goes, yeah, that's right. They go, well... Here's the thing, your guy, Daniel, he's not adhering to that. And you know what the law says, and according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, you can't go back on it. So now King Darius finds himself in a little bit of a predicament. And I, it's interesting to note, too, that King Darius is, is very upset about this. It says that he tried until sundown to figure a way to get Daniel out of this. But eventually... Those guys come back and say, you know what the law says. You got to do it. So reluctantly, uh, picking up in verse 16, it says, So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, and this is one of those verses you might want to start because we're going to come back to this. It says, The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you continually serve, rescue you. May your God, whom you continually serve, rescue you. I find it interesting to note that in this particular phrase, what King Darius is saying is, I have failed. I tried to get you out of this. I couldn't do it. 
So now, last-ditch effort, your God is going to have to come through with you, or for you in this particular event. It's cool to note that King Darius puts this law into place, but in the end, Daniel breaks it, or Daniel breaks it, and then in the end, he can't do anything to save Daniel. In contrast to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that established the law, you and I have broken that law. And rather than just going, well, there's nothing I can do, he goes, no, I'm going to send, I'm going to come down in the form of Jesus and die on your behalf, not to do away with the law, but to fulfill it. And it was like, wow, that's kind of cool seeing that in there. But anyway, the king goes, I can't do it. You're on your own. Let's see if your God is legit. And so he's sad, he's, he's, he's bummed out, he goes home, he's in anguish, he wants to, he, he, he fasts for the night, doesn't eat anything, he doesn't want any kind of entertainment, he's pretty distressed over this thing. And so in verse 19, it says, At the first light of the dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den, first thing in the morning. In verse 20, when he reached the den, he cried out in anguish to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, the king said, Has your God, whom you continually serve, been able to rescue you from the lions? And then Daniel spoke with the king. May the king live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth, and they haven't harmed me, for I was found innocent before him. And also before you, your majesty, I have not done harm. And so the king gets Daniel out, finds those who tried to uh, develop or devise this plan against Daniel, and he, they throw them and their family into the lion's den. And then in the end, King Darius proclaims to everyone that the God of Daniel is the God of all gods. And that's how the chapter wraps up. And so for us this morning, I said there were a few verses that, that, that we looked at that, we, that I was telling you, you could maybe underline. And they are going to be key for us as we look at what we're going to be focusing on today, and that is um, Daniel's reputation. And the first was found in chapter 3, or verse 3 of chapter 6, and that was that he had an extraordinary spirit. That he had an extraordinary spirit. We saw it in chapter 5. The queen mother, she recognized that because of Nebuchadnezzar recognizing that in him. And so he had this reputation of having an extraordinary spirit. Also, down in verse 10, another place that I suggested you underline was just as he had done before. So he's praying and he's petitioning God, giving thanks, just as he'd always done. And then lastly, there's two verses, but they say the same thing. It's 16 and, and verse 20, where King Darius notes, Hey, Daniel, your God, whom you continually serve. And he notes that Daniel is consistently, continually serving his God. And so in these three verses, we see what I would consider consistency. Again, he's this 80-year-old man, and for, he's been in captivity for about 70 years. And throughout those 70 years, he's been, a known, he's been known as a man who is consistent when it comes to following his God, that he's faithful in it. And so that leads to the main point of everything that we're going to focus on this morning, and that is that consistency leads to reputation. Consistency is what leads to reputation. Henry Ford said it this way. He said, you can't build a reputation on what you are going to do. Maybe you want to have the reputation of, of this thing here, but our actions are doing this. And so it's not what you want to hopefully have happen or what you would like to do. Instead, what you are currently doing and what you consistently do is what your reputation is built on. You want to have a reputation of stability? You've got to be stable for many years kind of thing. And so consistency is what leads to reputation. But what's the relevance of that? Yeah, okay. What's the relevance? Well, the relevance is, uh, it's an old saying, right? That your reputation precedes you. Your reputation precedes you. Your reputation is typically the thing that people will either hear about or you know, encounter before they actually ever maybe physically encounter you personally. And this is important in this day and age, especially with social media, because it's easy for people, uh, whether you're applying for a job or you know, you're getting to know somebody, whatever, is they can go and they can find your social media accounts and then they can just look through your feed. What are your likes? What are your reposts? Uh, what are the, your comments? All those kind of things. And generally, you can, you can develop a reputation 
about somebody based upon those things that they post or they like. And so this is important for us because it's been said that reputation is cast is the shadow cast by character. Reputation is the shadow cast by character. And as sometimes we look at shadows, and I see them here, shadows can sometimes accurately depict what they're being cast from. But sometimes they're also distorted. But ultimately, what the shadow is, is not the real thing. It's the thing they're being cast from that matters. And that, for us, in our topic for today, is character. Make sure that we have good character, because that's ultimately where our reputation comes from. And so, we have a a hinge verse, and that's uh, verse 20, that I want to just kind of sit on for a little bit. Verse 20. In this verse, King Darius asks um, Daniel, he goes, Hey, Daniel, uh, has the God whom you continually serve, uh, did he rescue you? And this is an important question. This is, a, this is a key question that he's asking because the question is not about Daniel's faithfulness. No, the question is really about God's ability. The question that he's asking is not about his faithfulness because Daniel obviously would not be in the place that he's in if he wasn't faithful. He could have just said, yeah, whatever, and compromised, and no big deal. He wouldn't be there. But because he is there, now, as he said before, I, I can't do anything for you. It's up to your God. And now we're going to find out if your God is legit. And so I think this is uh, vital for us this morning because this is a question that King Darius asked many, many years ago. But I think it's also the question that the world is asking of us, you and I, today. This is the same question that they want to know is, is your God who you say he is? Is your God able to do what you say he can do? We just sang a song this morning, God is able. Do we really believe what we say? Do we believe that God is who we said he is? You know, as I as I was putting this together, I started thinking about uh, salespeople and. uh, Sometimes you can tell a bad salesperson just because like they really don't believe in what they're selling, they're just kind of going through the motions Some are shysty. We were talking about that earlier. Some are just good salespeople. They can sell you anything. And I don't know if any of you have ever got involved in MLM kind of businesses, like multi-level marketing, you know, like whether you're selling oils or shakes or jewelry or makeup, whatever. But initially, you know, you you were excited about it. But then at some point, you really didn't believe in the product. your, Your focus was other places. Maybe it was the money. And then it wasn't the product and, and you didn't believe in it. And so therefore, after you know that initial excitement wore off, you just were like, ah, it's not really for me. And I think that's kind of important for us because as believers and the world's looking on and they're asking that question, is your God everything you say he is? Is your God everything you say he is? And now I'm asking you that question for you to think about for yourself. Is this God who you proclaim, is he everything you say he is? And while you ponder that question, I'm going to tell you about, uh, tell you a little bit about something I've been doing for the last week and a half. So, uh, I think it was during the game a couple weeks ago, uh, an ad came on for this, this thing called Noom. I don't know if you've heard of it. N-O-O-M. Noom. And it's, it's this weight loss um, program. They got an app and, and, uh, of course, going through the holidays, just coming off the holidays, maybe New Year, New Me kind of thing. I was like, ah, you know, maybe I'll look into it because you know, the holidays were a little rough. As they say, it's uh, it's all fun and games, but your jeans don't fit no more, right? And then I was like, uh, okay, I'll look into this. So I'll pull it up. And uh, I signed up for the 14-day trial because I'm like, ah, they give you 14 days to try it out. And of course, my 14 days are about to run up, run out, so I'm going to cancel that because I'm cheap like that. But in the... <laughs> In the two weeks that I have been kind of doing this, it's been interesting, especially as it, you know, as it pertains to what we're talking about this morning. But Noom's thing is not just a typical weight loss where they go, hey, don't eat this food, but, you know, don't eat this and exercise. I mean, 
you don't really need an app to tell you that. Which, by the way, I'm just blown away that they still make wor- workout magazines. I mean, really, like, how many different ways can you do a push-up? And, you know, like, curl, like it's been how many years? But anyway, so I'm, I'm looking at this app, and it's interesting because when you sign up, they ask you a, a, a series of questions. And what they're getting at is they want to know you personally because when they set up some kind of program, whatever it is, it's tailored to you. And as you go through it, they're asking you all these questions because it's not just about not eating food and working out. It's about things in your life that cause you to do the things that you do. So at the heart of Noom, it's there are they focus on triggers in your life, and these triggers lead to thoughts, and those thoughts lead to actions, and those actions eventually lead to consequences, whether good or bad. And so there's triggers, thoughts, actions, consequences. And in their series of questions, they're trying to find out for you, what are those triggers in your life that cause you to either eat something or, or respond in a certain way or not do a certain activity? And uh, what inspires you, what doesn't inspire you kind of thing. And it was just pretty interesting because one of the things they said in there, too, was that you, uh, you know, it, it took all this time for you to develop your eating habits and to, for you to develop these cravings for what you like. And just like you learn those, you can also learn to like better things, healthier things. But it's going to take time. And I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. But why I bring that up and why I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting and appropriate for today is because, yeah, we can recognize that consistency leads to reputation. And we recognize that our reputation precedes us. But what do we do about it? As Matt says, you know, like the soap is no good unless you apply it. We got to find some way in order to apply this in order for it to produce results in our life. And so doing the Baptist thing, I'm going to do three D's for you this morning. And the first is, so some to do's, the first one is determine. In week one, Matt talked about resolve that is coming on the new year and, and, and do we resolve to to serve God? Are we going to resolve to follow God? Are we going to resolve to give what we can in order to be obedient to God? And in the CSB, the word for that in in chapter 1 is determined. Daniel determined not to sin against God. But that's not quite the determined that I want to focus on. Instead, the determined that I want to focus on is determining that God is who he said he is. Because going back to verse 20, that question that the world is asking of us and the question that King Darius asked of Daniel was, is your God who you say he is? And so for each of us, for you and for me, we have to determine whether or not if God is who he says he is. Is the God that we proclaim, the God, the, uh, the God that we proclaim, do we believe that he is who he is as he's revealed in the word? Because one of the things about this Noom app is they have what they call the YPB. And they help you figure this out through a bunch of questions too. But this YPB, and that's your big picture. Your your ultimate goal. What's the thing that is inspiring you to actually do this and to follow through? And the reason they want you to figure this out and the reason that they keep asking all these questions in order to really get at the heart of what's inspiring you to find your big picture is because they know that there's going to be ebbs and flows in your journey. You're going to have some ups, you're going to have some downs. And in those downs, if this over here, that your big picture is not inspiring you or is not inspiring at all, you're not going to be able to get out of that lull and you're just kind of going to get stuck there. And so for you personally, and for me personally, we have to determine if God, if God is this amazing God worth sacrificing, worth giving our life, worth giving all that we can in order to serve him, is he that true God? So we have to determine if he is who he says he is. Secondly, we got to diagnose. We got to diagnose pitfalls in our life, blind spots, or as Noom puts it, triggers. What are those things that ultimately lead you on a path uh, towards you know, the opposite of what you want to do? And in our case, we want to grow with God. We want to pursue Him. We want to live a life that is honoring to Him. So, what are those triggers or those blind spots, those pitfalls in our life that that cause us to go awry? 
and this is a great place for me to, to plug in connection groups, because we're getting ready to start those here soon. But if you're not connected, you find, you, it's, it's really hard to grow spiritually. Because I don't know about you, if, if sometimes you don't have anybody speaking into your life or if you don't have somebody on the outside looking in, when you just see you all the time, it's really hard to recognize any change. Especially when it comes to something as trivial as weight loss. And you look in the mirror every day and you see yourself. And you're like, I don't really see any change. It happens with parents and their kids. You see your kids every day. And sometimes it's hard to recognize the growth until you look back and you go, wow, it really changed in a short amount of time. And so for us, we need those people in our lives. We need to be together in community because you need to develop those solid relationships with people who can speak into your life. Now, this is not for people to just go up to you today after church and go, hey, man, you you should totally do this. Like, it's, it's... It's more than that. You have to develop serious and true relationship with people in order for you to be able to speak into into their lives and for you to accept that advice. So we determine that God is who He says He is, and then we we got to diagnose those, we'll just call it triggers, in our spiritual health that might lead us awry. And then lastly, we develop. We develop ways or habits in which we actively seek God. Do you have a, a prayer regimen? No? Well, you should develop it. Do you have a regular reading time? No? Well, it's probably a good help, a habit to develop. Do you have relationships with people who are going to pour into you? If not, it's good to develop those kind of relationships because ultimately those things are going to help us. And why does this matter? Like, why should I do these things? Why determine? Why diagnose? Why develop? Well, Because by determining that God is who we said he is, and by diagnosing triggers, you and I can develop a plan of action to pursue uh, him, pursue God, which leads to consistency over the long run. So one of the little things about this Noom app is that every day they call it, get over your uh, skanxiety. (laughs) And it's basically the scale, the anxiety of the scale. And so you got to use the same scale every morning and you got to weigh yourself at the same time every day and you got to log it. You got to log that weight. And the reason is because you're going to have some fluctuation in that. But it's good to see that you're actually trekking on your ultimate goal. That you're, you're still heading in the right direction even though there's some fluctuation in there. And that's good for us too. We need those people in our lives. We need those who who are consistently in our lives to be able to point us and show us that there's consistent growth happening. You see, because on one hand, we got people who, maybe it's you, that you had this mountaintop experience with God. And that was maybe years and years and years ago. And you were on this high, but since then, your trajectory has been in decline. Your spiritual health has been in decline. And you look back at that one moment, you go, yeah, but God did something 20 years ago, and it was amazing. I'm like, yeah, I get that. But God is still alive today, so we should be projecting in, the, uh, uh, trajecting in, a, in a positive way of growth and maturity. And then on the other hand, there's some of us that are a little bit overreactionary. We're very hard on ourselves. That yes, even though we are growing, and even though the trajectory is towards God and there's growth and maturity, we get into these little dips in our walk and we just beat ourselves up over it. I'm no good. I'm worthless. I won't ever succeed. There's just no hope for me. And we get into this rut of beating ourselves up. And so on one hand, we need an honest look in the mirror and go, wow, I'm really not healthy. And on the other hand, we go, Yeah, I may have goofed, but overall, I'm trending in the right direction. Because it's that consistency. That's what we want over the long run. And again, we know that consistency is what leads to our reputation. And most importantly, that consistency ultimately results in our spiritual growth and maturity. And speaking of growth and maturity, I I heard this story recently, and I found it really interesting. But it was a story about these elephants, and, and this man sees this field of elephants, 
And these elephants are not running away. These elephants are, are, are not caged. Instead, what's holding them there is this, this, this little piece of rope tied to a stake in the ground. And this guy is totally bewildered. He goes, I mean, seriously, like these big, powerful, gigantic animals are being held by this little string, or this rope. And, and he, so he finally sees a trainer and he runs over there and he's like, I, I got to know what's up with this. What's going on? And so the trainer tells the guy, he goes, well, when they're very young and much smaller, we use the same size rope to tie them. And at that age, it's enough to hold them. And as they grow up, they're conditioned to believe that they cannot break away. And they believe the rope can still hold them, so they never try to break free. And the reason I bring that story up is it applies to our growth and maturity. Is some of us have, we've, we've failed in the past, we've fallen, we have these issues. We've done some, some things in our lives that we're not proud of. And along with that has come a reputation. Maybe amongst friends, maybe amongst family. We carry this reputation. And we begin to believe that reputation about us. That, well, I guess this is just who I am. So I might as well go ahead and do what I'm going to do. Because that's what everyone expects of me. See, these elephants, were all, they all grew up in the same environment. So they all just assume that this rope is what that they can't break free from it. But had they had elephants outside that environment that didn't grow up, perhaps they would show them, like, this thing isn't going to hold you. Come, break free. And so we can see a couple of important lessons in that, that, one, we need to surround each other with other people who can speak into our lives from an outside perspective, that we're not just sitting in our own uh, echo chamber, listening to our own thoughts and beating ourselves up on that listening to a reputation that maybe we thought we we gained that we can't shed. And secondly, that we need to recognize and and hopefully grasp, determine that God is who he said he is. And if this God is who he said he is, then this God in his word tells me that I'm valuable. This God in his word shows me that I am of importance. This God in his word tells me that he has plans to utilize me for his kingdom work, that he has gifted me with his Holy Spirit and his Holy Spirit gives me these abilities and these talents and these gifts that I am to use to share with the body and ultimately bless my faith family and the world with it? Or are we still just kind of believing that old reputation that we're not capable, that we're failures, and we will never be consistent and thus we believe the one reputation about ourselves? Yes, consistency is what leads to our reputation. But we can consistently be like Daniel for these 70 years that he's in captivity. Not the place that he would want it to be. But while he was there, he continued to serve his God. He was known for having this extraordinary spirit. He was known of being a faithful person, so much so that they devised a plan to catch him in it. And he found himself in this lion's den. I'm sure that's not the place he wanted to be either. But he didn't just go from point A to point B. No, instead, this was kind of like his Super Bowl moment, right? Not where he wanted to be, but God didn't just take his new faith. and Because I'm sure someone young in the faith wouldn't have been able to withstand that pressure. But no, Daniel's like, I've been here, done this before. No biggie. Throw me in the lion's den. Whatever. My God is who I think he is, and you'll see eventually. And King Darius does, and he goes on to praise him. And so for you and I, again, let's develop this plan in our life to be consistent. Why? Because you and I should be known as being people of extraordinary spirit, just like Daniel, because the same spirit that was in Jesus that rose him from the dead, as Scripture says, is the same spirit that's in us. We all have these giftings and these abilities to be able to bless the world. And the world is looking on to say, do you really believe that this God is who you say he is? And if we determine in our hearts that he is, then we can be able to live a life that reflects that. And even though there's going to be some ebbs and flows in our growth, overall we're trajecting towards pursuing and growing in faith. And we should be known as people of extraordinary spirit because ultimately we serve a God who is extraordinary himself. And so church, I'm going to pray for you. And as I do so, I'm going to have the worship team come up. And 
some of us, like I was sharing, carry around this, this weight of the reputation that we once had. Some of us are struggling with whether or not we believe that God is who he said he is. Maybe you're here and you're just like, I, I just want to give this faith thing a try. Welcome. Glad you're here. Um, anything we can do to assist that, let us know. But if you need help in determining that, I just need some encouragement. I just need to hear some other testimonies that God is who he said he is. There are lots of stories in here about God's working in lives. Stories of God healing cancer. Stories of God, you know, fixing relationships. And maybe you need just need somebody to help you diagnose those blind spots, those triggers in your life. Whether you want it to be Pastor Matt or me or somebody else in the congregation, if you just need help with that, we'd be happy to plug you in with somebody. Or if you just need help developing a plan, a plan of action to help you grow, and to be consistent, and we can do that as well. But church, take this time as, as I pray. I want to pray over you. Take this time to, again, just, Decide in your heart, is this God who we say he is? Because we're going to sing this song, God, you're so good. Is he good? Do you really consider him to be good? Do you really consider him to be a God worth pursuing and sacrificing and giving your all for? Because once you figure that out, the rest just kind of falls into place. So let me pray for you, church. Father in heaven, thank you so much. Thank you for the gift of life you've given us. Thank you for the hope. Thanks for being the God that you are, that you are a consistent God. You are a God who wants to be known. You are a God who saves. As we look back through through time, we see that you were faithful in providing for Abraham when you called him out of the uh, Ur of the uh, Chaldees. God, that you were faithful to bring him that son you promised even in old age. That you're the God who spoke and revealed yourself to Moses through the burning bush and, and you gave them safe passage out of Egypt through the wilderness. You're the same God who preserved the life of Joseph and ultimately preserved your people, Israel. That you're a God who enabled King David to slay Goliath. And that you were are able to raise your son Jesus from the dead to show us that you fulfilled all the law and that there's freedom in you. God, help us to be able to determine in our hearts, our heart of hearts, that you are the God who you say you are, that you are the God who is worth pursuing, that you are good and you you are for us you love us you you pursue us you want to give us this new life this this, to shed off that old reputation and be able to take on a new one and that's pursuing you but god of course we get in the way so i just pray for my brothers and sisters that you would empower them you would equip them you would encourage them to be able to lead the lives you've called us to God, that you would help us to be able to surround one another and speak into each other's life encouragement, to build each other up and to to recognize those giftings so that we can share with one another and also bless the world outside of these walls and, and bless our neighbors and our community, those who don't know you, so that they would see your power in us. Help us, through your Holy Spirit, to be characterized as people of extraordinary spirit because you are an extraordinary God. You are good. And so as we sing these praises to you, we hope that you are delighted. God, have your way. And let it all be for your glory. And we pray all this in the name of King Jesus. Amen.